is ground into a fine dust, and the material containing iron is separated from the waste material and processed into these taconite pellets, which are approximately the size of small marbles and contain over 65% iron. shelter there so it doesn't blow the cold dust into this bay here. St. Marie, Ontario, employing approximately 2,900 men and women with an annual payroll and local purchases exceeding $1.2 billion. Algoma is one of the more diverse steel-making operations in North America, producing more than 700 different specifications of steel, which are shipped all over the world. A complete 65-mile railway system with 17 diesel locomotives and over 700 railway cars to operate within this plant area. During the navigation season, more than 400 Great Lakes and ocean vessels load and unload along the dock area ahead of us. And the purple color material ahead of us is more of that taconite iron ore pellets. The large steel tower up on our right, and there's another one on the other side of this first unloading bridge. Those are the blast furnaces. The manufacture of steel requires measured quantities of taconite, coke, and limestone. The principal fuel in this operation is coke, which is coal that has been baked in ovens. This black over to our left right here in front of this limestone, that's, um, there was a big pile of coke there, but they just got rid of it, or moved it, so that's what's left of it right now. Molten limestone removes impurities from the iron and coke to form slag, which is a waste product. The molten iron settles to the bottom of the blast furnace and is transported to casting machines and steel making furnaces. Additional materials are added to the raw iron to make steel, which is then shaped on rolling mills. here anymore. This is strictly for pleasure craft. The vessel you are on is one of the largest that will pass through here. Other pleasure crafts range from motor boats and tugboats to large sailboats and yachts. Even kayaks, canoes, and wave runners can pass through this lock. And there's no charge to use the Canadian lock. Beginning to open. steel structure along the left side of the canal is the swing bridge, which is that third movable section of the Canadian National Railway Bridge. It was built in 1887 and it swings across over to our right where you can see that platform where it connects, allowing trains to cross several times a day. Only once. On June 9, 1909, the Canadian passenger boat Assiniboia was tied up at the upper end of the lock while the American freighter Crescent City was entering the lock behind her. At that instant, the American freighter Perry G. Walker crashed through the lower gates of the lock due to a misunderstood engine room signal. When the gates were broken open, the current swept both Assiniboia and Crescent City through the lock at approximately 40 miles per hour. Fortunately, there was no loss of life, although considerable damage was done to the vessels involved.
enter the old Canadian lock. And these little buildings on the left and right hand side up here, they'll have some windows with pictures in them. The left hand side will have pictures of when the lock was being constructed. And the right hand side will have pictures of when the accident took place in the lock. Right below those is the gates to the original lock, which are still painted red and constructed of Douglas fir from British Columbia. River system. As part of an important commercial highway, this canal facilitated the movement of raw materials from the west to markets in the east, as well as the movement of people and products westward. At the time this lock was completed, it was the largest lock in the world at 900 feet long, and it maintained this distinction until the Davis Lock was opened by the United States in 1914. Most of the buildings necessary to operate this site were built in the 1890s from the local red sandstone. In 1979, the Sault Ste. Marie Canal was transferred from the St. Lawrence Seaway Authority to Parks Canada to be operated as a heritage canal, and in 1987, the canal was declared a National Historic Site. If you look along the left-hand side of the lock wall, you'll see some black cables, which are used by pleasure craft to tie down on the lock. They merely slip one or more of their lines behind those cables, and that allows them to slip up or down depending upon whether they are being raised or lowered. Those cables simplify the line handling needed to transit the lock. We're going down now. You can see the difference in the water line to where the water is. We're going down to Lake Huron level in the Canadian lock. And all of us around here, all of us here, is Canada.
Yeah, why are you dying?